All right, guys, so we already um, determined that we need to go to high precision in the two body problem to see this uh, effect of the UV physics, what we call the UV physics, this deformation, this tidal love number, which very interestingly vanishes for black holes, but it also gives us a handle about the equation of stable neutron stars. So possibly we need to get to at least 5 p.m. and maybe even a higher order. So now we come to the second part of our effective field theory approach, which is to describe the two body problem as a wall line theory that would allow us to also compute the gravitational wave emission, which is ultimately what LIGO and Virgo uh, observe, and maybe even Lisa and the Einstein telescope in the future. So we're gonna do the same. We're gonna construct the same uh, wall line theory. The difference now is that when we try to do this matching that I described last time, we kind of know the full theory now, because once we describe the wall line theory here, this uh, pawn-like objects, in terms of this high derivative operator, the mass, the spin, the love number, and so on. For example, the love number will be in the description of this world of theory. What is left now is also, we are assuming that GR is the correct theory at long distances. It's basically pure GR equations, right? So they are GR, like gravitational modes at the scale R, the scale of the separation of the binary, and there are gravitational modes at the scale lambda of the radiation, right? And now we just need to solve Einstein's equations with some source that is given by this Volan theory that we described. One of the nice things is, that, is though that now, even though we know exactly what the theory is, the theory is difficult. It's hard to solve, like QCD, we know QCD. QCD is still difficult. So having effective full theory descriptions of QCD are extremely useful. And we will borrow from those ideas of QCD, effective theories in QCD, such as non-relativistic quantum chromodynamics, NRQCD, or heavy quark effective theory, HQET, that will give us also a handle of how to tackle this problem, the two-body problem in, in gravity. And in fact, some of these ideas go by the name of non-relativistic general relativity. And this was an idea that was originally put forward by uh, Goldberger and Rosting. Rosting was my advisor. And I put the review, I, I wrote a long review that you can also uh, read. There will be many more details and, and you can obviously ask me questions. Shoot me an email if you have any question after the, the, the talk and so on. And I did, this was done around uh, um, 2004, 2005 and the spin part that I described earlier was part of my PhD work, okay? So these ideas, as you will see, they have a direct connection to what happens in QCD. The main difference is that everything is gonna be classical. There won't be any, any quantum loops around, there won't be any, uh, any uh, fermionic or, or any propagating the degrees of freedom associated with, the, with this object, these are external sources, and that will be the main difference. But otherwise, many things are gonna go uh, the exact same way as you will see momentarily. I mean, of course, we don't radiate glue. That's a little bit of a difference. We do radiate gravitational waves, and that's actually gonna make the radiation problem much more interesting than what happens in, in QCD, at least from the classical point of view. Okay, so here we're gonna do uh, what uh, we often do since we are in the regime in which these guys are far apart. We're gonna span the, oh, I should use this guy. We're gonna span the gravitational field around flat space and this is gonna be our metric perturbation. So we are not gonna do, as I described uh, at the beginning, we're not gonna do the full uh, dynamics, including the merger. We're gonna assume that it's a small perturbation of, uh, uh, of flat space time as, as I'm, I'm gonna try to solve here, this is gonna be an expansion in GM over R, little r, right, of R over lambda, R being this lambda, which is V and V is smaller than one, so we have a control uh, perturbative expansion, okay? The main difference here, what is, what is the tool that we're gonna use to construct the wall line theory now for the binary? The main tool will be to split this metric perturbation into two modes or what is called two regions. And some of you may be familiar with this terminology, which is called the method of regions. And throughout this lecture, you will see what this really means. What, what are we actually doing with this split of the method of regions? But from the point of view on effective field theories, what it means is that we are decomposing the modes of a field and the modes of those fields could be heavy or could be light. And therefore we can get rid of some of the modes of the field that are heavy and construct an effective theory that only keeps the light degrees of freedom. So it will be the same that you will do with heavy particles, but we're gonna do it with, uh, with the modes of the field. So it's like a mode decomposition. So it's very Wilsonian in some sense, right? Which is what we often do also to compute the RG fluid. 
So here, these regions or these modes of the gravitational field are going to split into mainly two, two regions. In more complicated theories, um, like soft collinear effective theory and so on, that some of you may have heard of, we have soft mode, we have ultra soft mode, collinear modes, Clauber modes, etc. So we're going to use that idea here for a completely classical problem, but we're going to have just two regions or two modes. Which modes do we have? Well, we have the so-called potential mode, which is the mode responsible here for the binding. These are not on-shell modes. These are off-shell modes. What does that mean? Well, it means that the typical momentum is of the order one over R. This is the typical binding, but they are quasi instantaneous, which means that the time variation is done by V. In other words, if we were static, this would be just the one over R Coulomb potential, say, if we were doing electromagnetism, then there wouldn't be any time dependence. This will be instantaneous, as you know. I mean, you have to be careful. These are not on shell modes, they're gauge dependent. We're going to get rid of them. They are not going to contribute directly to the observable. The binding energy will be an observable, but not this guy. And therefore, if you move a little bit away from the static uh, uh, solution, then the, you develop some time dependence, but that time dependence is suppressed by powers of V. As we will see, we will see this how this comes out. I mean, there is a lot of uh, intuition about finding the right modes. This is really an art. As you will see, what it means ultimately will be that we have a very complicated theory that will be removing the gravitational field in our action. And then we'll get a lot of Feynman diagrams with full propagators of this gravitational field. And the idea is that we get some Feynman integrals. And those Feynman integrals will have main contributions from different regions of momentum. One of, that, of those contributions is the potential region of this Feynman integral, in which the mode is off shell. And we can really say that the full propagator, if it's off shell, that epsilon doesn't really matter, can be expanded in powers of P0 over P, essentially in powers of V over, over. OK? So these are the off shell potential modes in which the P0 is much, much less than P. And this, part, this expansion at the level now of the integrand which you have to show actually that it works. And it's actually not that easy to show. And I can give you the, 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 the main ideas how you prove this. How can you expand inside an integrand? Because you're completely screwing the, the IR and the UV of the theory. In fact, we will see this happening. We will spoil the IR and the UV, especially the IR by doing this, right? By putting P's downstairs, okay? But it doesn't matter if we have it under control, if we really decouple the modes of the gravitational fields correctly, okay? And we don't overlap between regions. Because which other region do we have? Well, we have the obvious radiation modes, the ones in which are literally on shell. These are the modes that we get to see far away from the detector. These are the modes that vary on the scale of the radiation. And as I, as I determined earlier, lambda is of the order of uh, R over V, and therefore the derivative scales like B over. And then what's going to happen here? Well, what happens here is we can integrate out the same way that I was asked at the beginning. We can solve for these potential modes and plug them back into the action. OK, we're going to use the, the jargon of particle physics. We're going to use the path integral. We're going to use Feynman tools and so on. But, but in practice, uh, which I think is called the Fokker action, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Thibault Damour goes around saying that Fokker had even diagrams that resemble the Feynman diagrams that Feynman later uh, took or didn't steal, but actually took in his perturbative approach from Fokker to develop the similar ideas. So Fokker was doing similar things, and sometimes it's called the Fokker action. Uh, the, the terminology doesn't really matter. We're really solving for these modes, which are heavy in our long distance theory, plug it back into the action and construct an effective theory, which only keeps the long distance modes, in this case, the radiation field. Okay? That, that's going to be the same we did before. If we, we could have done the same if we, if we actually did the calculation for the binding of a, of a compact object, many of these potential modes will contribute, but obviously there are other fields, the calculation is more complicated. This calculation, this one here, we can actually do. Okay, obviously here the epsilon matters. And in fact, uh, this is one question that you can ask, so how, how did I come out with these epsilon? And, and this will, will come out uh, uh, momentarily because we're gonna have to choose boundary conditions when we do this calculation, what do we assume? We, say, we assume, for example, that it's an in-out calculation or it's an in-in calculation. This will appear in terms of this I epsilon prescription that I will tell you how to choose the correct I epsilon prescription depending on the observable that we want to compute. 
But certainly for potential nodes, which are off shell, these I epsilons or the cats actually they are not there. So we don't care about the I epsilons. These these guys we can just expand. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the exact same thing we did before. Uh, for the long distance theory, these potentials are UV physics, and then we're going to get rid of them. Okay. And an important point here, which is a little bit different from what we did before, once we wrote the log number as a coupling in the Wolland theory, as a coefficient, this CE coefficient, times the E mu nu, E mu nu operator, C is a number, meaning this is fully diffeomorphism environment. Now we are in a post-Newtonian regime in which we are in a two-body problem, in which we are now solving this imperturbatively around flat space and doing perturbative expansions around velocities. Uh, so we will break a lot of the symmetries, and therefore it's not, um, it's not obvious how to recover, for example, even Lorentz invariance. But what is clear is that the same decoupling that we had in the case of the log number, which gives me a fully diffeomorphism invariant uh, theory, here is a little trickier because we do not decouple in time. So we only decouple in space. And this is very clear because the time variation of the potential and the time variation of the radiation is the same. What does that mean? Well, that means that when we write our Wilson coefficients, our effective description, that I, I actually spent some time at the beginning with the QAB as a function of time, having a sh an expectation value on the short modes and a response. In the, in the tidal log number case, the response was the most important if we ignore spin. In the binary case, the expectation on the short modes will be the important part because the short modes for us will be this potential. And that's what we want to calculate. We don't put the binary in an external field. Um, for now, I mean, there is the radiation too, but let's, let's ignore that for now. How does that modifies the, the, the effect of the binary in an external field? But what we really need to calculate to get the flux is the expectation value of this quadrupole moment on the short modes of the gravitational field or the potentials. Okay? So that means our theory is going to have time dependent couplings. So we're going to have space, space like derivative expansion, which you kind of expect to have because it's R over lambda. Right, but not in time. And in fact, the same will happen if some of you have some uh, background on this in cosmology. There is the effective theory of large scale structure. And in the effective theory of large scale structure, what happens is that you also decouple in space, this nonlinear scale, but you do not decouple in time either because you change on a Hubble time. Everything changes on a Hubble time. So then, then you have also perhaps even non locality in time, and you have to be careful how to comparate that. And for us, if you include dissipation, we could have in principle also non-locality in time, okay? So that, that uh, is a, a little caveat that we have to keep in mind, but that, that aside, now what we need to do is exactly the same that we did before. Um, we need to, did I put the same thing? Oh yeah. So we need to precisely integrate out the potential modes and match now into a wall line theory for the binary, where we only keep our light degrees of freedoms, which are the radiation field. And everything else, all the, the particles, the love numbers, plus the potentials will go into uh, the, the Wilson coefficients, the, the short distance physics, which for us, as I described in the beginning, is the mass, which we uh, talked about in the case of the isolated uh, um, uh, neutron star or black hole, the quadrupole moment, uh, by the way, they, this could also both be time dependent. And in fact, the M dot will be the flux, but I'll get back to that. Um, the quadrupole moment, which will be time dependent, as I was saying, there are space derivatives here, and, and uh, we're going to consider here a time varying uh, object, which will give us the fluxes. Okay? And this will be a multiple expansion, and I'm going to tell you a little bit how to set up uh, this uh, multiple expansion, but it's, it's relatively straightforward to realize what there will be a, an E and a B component. The, the B component, the magnetic coupling, will be the current. So you can have a quadrupole, a mass quadrupole, and a current quadrupole, a J coupled to B. But I, I, I don't want to clutter the notation, but this is clear. That will be electric and magnetic. The same way that here you will write P dot E and M dot B. This is the same, OK? But the higher order terms that you will write also in electrodynamics, you can write here. For example, you can write, you can write a three indices. And then what you need to do here is you write uh, the derivative and you symmetrize it, OK? So you can have a derivative expansion of higher multiple moments. And this we can do to any order that we want. 
because every derivative costs me a factor of r over lambda okay and this is this is essentially uh what we need to do here we need to do this derivative expansion and we need to then tell me who these guys are so now the new thing is that these guys and by the way the m is also what i was telling you before this m is not just the sum of the masses the same way that this m was not the sum of the masses in the neutron star case the same way that this m matching for the schwarzschild black hole is a little subtle right because it's the m that appears in the solution of einstein's equations in vacuum right uh, for us this m will include the binding it will include the mass m1 and m2 but certainly also the binding energy that keeps these two guys together otherwise they would just fly apart um, and the q the one that we care about all these multiples not just the quadruple all of them the one that we care about is the one the expectation value on the short modes and what does that mean wait a second they're cleaning the holes but it's going away um, okay sorry sorry about that so what does that mean now uh, What does that mean? Is that I went too far down? It means that these guys, these cues, not only know about the particles one and two, it also knows about the potential. Uh, Sorry, Rafael, there is a question uh, yeah. in the chat. Yes, is... I hope this this, uh, this noise doesn't bother people too much. Yes. No, I think the noise is okay, but the question is: Is m the ADM mass? Ah no, this is the this is the bonding mass. What is called the bonding mass. Very good question. No, it's not the ADM mass. So this is what is called. This is what it's called. This is probably some relativist asking the question because this question is being asked uh, uh, um, all the time. This is not the conserved charge. So in fact, there's an m dot different than zero. Okay, so it's 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 uh, it's the bonding mass in the following sense. It includes only. It includes only this binding here okay so this mass is being lost into the fluxes so it does not include the adm mass that is the conserved quantity that's the usual way that the relativists define it okay but but this distinction actually this is a very good question right adm mass bonding mass i had no freaking clue who bonding mass or what the bonding mass of the adm mass was until the relativists asked us these questions that we actually answer it just means it's a matching coefficient in my theory. I just need to tell you what it is by matching, okay? And then I realized that it, it has a, an equation that resembles m dot equals flux, and therefore this is the binding energy that we lose that it goes into the flux. So there's a balance equation that comes out. And this is what people call the bonding mass because it's not the usual conserved quantity ADM mass and so on. That includes also the radiation, by the way. We are not doing that. And this is very important because precisely the point is that we are matching into the uv physics but we're keeping the long distance modes of the radiation field okay so that's that's uh, interesting rafael maybe i can quickly also follow up so you mentioned that uh, well if we expand around the uh, flat space uh, the lorentz uh, we have we expect to have lorentz symmetry but you break it when you do this various expansion is there a way to control in the end that your answer is actually respect lorentz symmetry yes yes you can you can, in fact, you can do this all the by order in the post Newtonian expansion, you construct the charges, like the P's and the J's and so on, and then the algebra actually closes. And you can show that you have Lorentz invariance uh, order by order in the, in the uh, PN expansion. Okay. Indeed, it's, 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 it's non-trivial and subtle, and this is in fact something that the relativists use a lot for getting the, the consistency of the calculations and to show precisely. Sometimes, for example, they, they can fix some unknown coefficients this way. In fact, at the beginning with spin, I never did this because my, my theory, our theory was much easier, but they used this consistency with Lorentz invariance to, to constrain, for example, how the final size effects, this spin square terms could contribute. And this is a, a, a non-trivial constraint, but it's a good question, right? You can actually check that this is, this is the case. Okay. So now we need the QABs with the potentials in them. Okay, this is gonna be, sorry, this is gonna be, uh, oh no, that's not what I wanted. This is gonna be uh, our task. It, will, it won't be just MXX as you would naively expect. It will be MXX, the quadruple, right? Plus corrections. 
because the binding will also radiate and therefore will also dress the QAB, okay? So once again, we need to do a matching. Once, by the way, but once again, it's the same theory. So this is number one, the same theory. We know it has to take this form. We know that this type of matching always in GR lands into this type of decomposition plus angular moment. So here, uh, I'm cheating here. There is a part which also has the coupling that I uh, uh, wrote before. Uh, so plus the, the angular momentum also enters there. And if you remember, there is a coupling of the angular momentum to the, to the Ricci rotation coefficients. And if you go to the rest frame of the guy, it actually pick up the zero, the zero component. So there will be here also angular momentum, okay? But I don't wanna complicate things. We are after um, the, the flux, the radiation. So yes, we do have the mass and the angular momentum. And yes, those two will radiate. There will be dots of those guys because you will lose also angular momentum into the flux. And this is things that we can also compute, okay? Very good. But the good, the nice thing is that we already did all the work. We already know it takes this form. All we need to do is match for these guys. And now, unlike the tidal love number, now what we need is expectation value on the short modes and the short modes include potential. Very easy. So this time we know the UV physics because what is the UV physics? Well, the UV physics here is a binary. It's a binary. So in, before we did the complete generic, but now we know that here we have potentials. So this team you knew of the full theory now includes also the potential modes. And this is what we need to do. We need to do this matching of the team you know of the full theory and to the team you know of this theory. That would be the ultimate way to do it. But what we mean is that we need to match the multiples, which are the moments of this team you know in this derivative expansion. Okay? So it's the same thing that we've been doing over and over. We do an expansion in derivatives. We want to match, for example, the first order guy, which is our multiple. And now the scale little r, the scale of the binary, will be hidden inside the queues. And everything else is long. This is long, which means only depends on the radiation. This guy here only depends on the radiation. And the scale r is here because, as you know, qij newton is mxx. And then the scale r is clearly here. And this is the paradigm of effective theory all along uh, in space. The decoupling here happened in space, which is I can write a local theory with local operators on the long distance light fields. And all the UV physics is stressed in some coefficients, which in this case are a little bit more complicated than just numbers like we did before. Uh, but these are just coefficients that carry all the information about the UV scale, which in this scale, in this case is R. Okay. So now we just need to do uh, the matching. But one thing that would be useful for us is do it generically. So imagine if you have a blob, non, it's not necessarily yet the binary case. Imagine we had this blob that is changing, the quadruple moment is changed, there is a time dependent team, you know, and that thing is radiated, okay? So how do we compute now the, the, the skews as a function of the team you know of the system? And I'm gonna do it generically because later we can just go to the particular case of two particles and it's even easier. But this is very generic and it can be applied to many um, uh, different situations. So let's start with the theory that couples, um, that it has the potential modes integrated out. So how is it gonna look like? Well, actually sometimes this is called um, the pseudo uh, stress energy tensor in the sense that here, this theory here, this, uh, let's call it different if you want. This is the conserved quantity. So this is the guy who has d mu t mu nu equals zero which is not the team you knew that you will naively, like, that you have not naively, that the one in, in GR, which is covariantly conserved, right? Because here we still have the diff of the long distance theory of the linearized theory with linearizing in H bar. I'm not including yet uh, the, the nonlinear corrections in the radiation field. I'm keeping the field linear in the radiation. We're computing the waveform of the amplitude, the one point function. We're making it easy for now. We don't include something called the memory effects, for example, yet. Okay, we can do it, but let's ignore memory that Sasha worked on, but let's just do the one point function. We will do tails, but no memory, okay? Um, so this is the conserved team you knew because here we have the symmetry that you, that you know, this one, right, the symmetrized. And therefore this will be our conserved quantity of the team you know. So how are we gonna do the matching here? So what we're going to do is we're gonna, we're gonna do a multiple expansion. And at the level of the action, 
this multiple expansion uh, is basically just taking the, the radiation field and expand it, say, around the center of mass. In this case, it would be like the center of mass of the binary, but it could be any point in the block. Like the, you can choose any point, but you can choose the center of mass because it will be the one that moves at constant speed and it will make our life easier. Okay, and you just do a derivative expansion. Why are we doing a derivative expansion? Because this x here are going to have support on the scale, little scale r, and these derivatives are going to pick up the one over lambda. So this will be the r over lambda expansion. But we can do it at the level of the fields. And this will be very useful to write an action and to match at the level of the action by doing this derivative expansion here. Okay, as you, as you will see in a second, uh, what's going to happen is that when you put this guy in here, the support of the T minu will pick where this X, where this X live. And now it's, you have to be careful when you have memory or, or even with tails because the support of these guys could be the entire space time. And then you have to be careful because you can have divergences that you can remove in defective theory again and so on. So there are subtleties once you include memories or tails, but let's ignore that for, the, for a moment. So we think about the support of these guys just inside R. So this is a very well-defined well expansion because after we plug this in the action, so then we get terms that are basically integrals of the T minu in the volume where those T minus have support on which we are thinking here is this. Here I just put the leading term. So if you just keep this guy and you plug it in here, the leading order term will be t mu nu h mu nu integrated in a space. And so what is this? So now you can pull out this h pip outside. And then what you get is a moment of t mu nu coupled to our long distance field, okay? And this is what we need to match then to the effective theory. So this expansion here is doing the decoupling in space that we talked about that would allow us to match this into a point particle theory because this already looks like a local interaction. This already looks like a dt integral, which is the, the dt that we have in the wall line theory, times some object here. Does not yet look like a qij, eij, -E but we're going to bring it to that form. That's going to be our task. We need to match now this into our theory, but our theory has the QIJ, EIJ, or QAB, AAB. But since we're gonna look at the one-point functions, which are on shell, which are physical, we can always do this matching with the physical degrees of freedoms, which are the transverse and traceless. And that just comes out from the fact that the EIJ is symmetric and, and trace-free, okay? And we can only look also to the space-like components because the H00 guys, that do not radiate. In fact, you can show that the zero zero and the longitudinal modes, they cancel each other because of the war identity, the same way that it happens in QED. And therefore we can just look at the, long, at the transverse uh, uh, um, physical modes in, in the, in the uh, space uh, direction. So these are the usual gravitational waves uh, uh, on shell modes, okay? So we can plug this guy in here and therefore we can just look at the IJ components of this object. And now comes the catch or the trick, if you want, which is we use moments of the T minu, what is called moments relations. Because this T minu, which is not the T minu of matter alone, is the T minu which is conserved. It is our pseudo T minu, if you want. It's this T minu that, that has, uh, that is associated with this, with this gauge symmetry of the long distance linearized uh, gravitational field. That guy being conserved, allows us to basically do what is called a moment relation. So I'm gonna leave this as an exercise, otherwise I, I don't have much time, but it's very easy to see that when you start taking derivatives, if you trade these derivatives by space-like space derivatives, the T0, T0 by Di, Ti, and you integrate by parts, you're gonna start hitting the excess, you kill the excess, and you integrate twice, so that's what you need to have, and you end up in this guy. So the integral of Tij becomes the integral of T0, 0, 0, Xi, Xj times two derivatives, okay? And this derivative hits, is the partial derivative, that which is important, it hits this T. So I can take it outside of the integral because this is a space-like integral. So I can take this guy outside. And now, because this is integrated everywhere in the space, this can be a total derivative if you want. And since here there is an integral in time, we can that, integral by parts and put it in this guy. 
And therefore, we integrate by parts, often known as IBP, uh, <clears throat> in different contexts. In this one, it's the simplest possible context. You integrate by parts, and you basically, whoop, you pick it up, uh, 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 you pass it on this guy uh, here. Um, the minus is because here there is a minus. Here there should have been an M plank that I didn't write because we have uh, actually here I didn't write it this way, just not to clarify the, the notation. But often, as you know, some we sometimes put this guy here. So the bulk action gets rid of the M plank square in front of the Einstein Hilbert action. So I'm not doing that now, but you can carry all those by yourself just to make our life easier. This will be the G Newton that's going to pop out later, okay? Uh, but you, you should be easily, I'm using M Planck equal, equal one units for now, but you should be easily um, uh, being able to put them back. Um, and then if you integrate by parts, then we get this guy, sorry. And then, um, then the point is that in the TT on shell gauge, we're doing the matching on shell, it's very easy to see that this is the guy that survives. So the EIJ and TT gauge is just two derivatives of this guy. And in fact, for those of you who have done gravitational waves, um, you know precisely how this comes out from the Riemann tensor. In fact, when you're doing the, how do you get this guy usually in the standard way of thinking about gravitational waves? Well, you look at the, at the um, geodesic deviation to look at how these points are getting close to each other. And then you have a contribution from R, C, O, I, C, O, J, which is indeed this E. And then you go to the TT gauge, and this guy then becomes uh, J double dot. Uh, and this is basically how this is coming out here for us in the matching. Okay. Now, if I had not done the matching, sorry, on shell, then I would have had to keep all the unphysical degrees of freedom. They will all contribute. I would have gone not just into the TIJ here, I would have had to do the TI zero part and so on. And then you can see that you actually build up the full EIJ. But since we can do the matching on shell, it's much easier. We just keep the degrees of freedom that contribute. And therefore, then we can directly replace this guy by the EIJ. And then the signs, there is a sign choice here that has to do with the sign conventions. They cancel out, and then we get, uh, as I described here, other terms which are traces, etc. You can also obtain in this fashion. If you keep the unphysical modes, you can match the full thing. OK? Um, and then you can just compare. If we replace this guy by this guy, then this looks exactly as our Warland theory. This looks like our QIJ is exactly, is exactly this guy. Actually, maybe it's just this guy. So what do we learn is that a leading order in derivatives. This is very important. We're doing many expansions here, remember. A leading order in derivatives. The derivatives expansion that we did here is this derivative expansion. We only keep kept this term. A leading order in derivatives, we match our quadrupole into this. I haven't done any post-Newtonian expansion yet, any expansion of who this T00 is. So you will see there will be more than one expansion here. They're all, they're all linked through this scaling of in V, but they're independent in principle. So we need to keep going in the derivative expansion. This is our leading order in derivatives. So the next order in derivatives will be this guy. The same as before, but now we go to the next term, this guy. So now we have a derivative of this guy. And we have an integral of this over here. So still we can use moment relations, et cetera, but we can also simplify our lives by using a little bit of group theory. It's just by looking at the way these things transform this transforms like as a symmetric two, this is a one, and then you can decompose it into a three that will give you a contribution to the octopole because it's gonna match to something that is gonna have the HIJ zero zero derivatives as before, but it's gonna have an extra derivative. And therefore, that extra derivative is gonna go into here. So it's gonna contribute to another derivative of E, so it's gonna go into the octopole. But there will be a contribution also to the current, to the magnetic two that I did not uh, uh, write explicitly, but the, the coupling to the, to the current, this is a J, I, J, B, I, J coupling, where B is the magnetic part of the vial tensor, which has the epsilon uh, W, E. Okay? 
So you do the match in the exact same way, you're now gonna get the B component of the, of the, uh, um, of the, of the Riemann tensor or the Weiss tensor, if you want, from this matching the same way that we got here, the E component. And then you read off what J is, and J is what you expect, right? It's the moment now of the, the T0K part, it has velocities in the PN expansion when we open this guy. This guy will have a velocity, this guy will start with mass because T0 a leading order in post-Newtonian is just mass. And then you see how these expansions are linked. We're gonna expand here up to some order in R over V, in R over lambda, sorry, which will be some order in V, but each one of these guys has to be P and expanded as well. But the nice thing is that we have this systematically separated and we can do everything that we need. Keep the derivative expansion generic up to some E over lambda, R over lambda order, open up the T's as we will do and keep them up to some PN order, whichever PN order that you need. And then you will be done. And all you need to do is match the T's and you'll be done, okay? So that's our J. And you keep going and you can write a lot of corrections to all the multiples as moments of T. In fact, this guy, this QIJ, when you go to the second derivative, will also correct the QIJ. Because when you go to the guy that is a two, two, you're gonna have four, three, and two, and that two will be electric and it will correct this guy. So when you do the tensor decomposition, you will get corrections here from higher order derivatives as well. Okay? Because these are independent in principle, this derivative expansion. So very good. So what we need to do to do is continue the group theory. I could write here, but it's in in in, uh, in the you can read the review. This the form of all the moments, all the the multiple moments in terms of moments of the T minu. So this is the leading order J. This is the order Q. In fact, it's obvious that the leading order Q I J K L blah 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 will be X I X L blah blah blah, right? With the T zero zero, this will be all the leading order multiples. But they're all gonna get corrected, and you'll see in a second, for example, the one. A correction that we will need to compute the 1pn uh, flux that I will try to get at, at the end of the lecture, hopefully, okay? So after we did this completely generically, for any blob of matter that has some T mu nu, we, the, the, the pseudo T mu nu, right, that includes also the potential, we now need to match that T mu nu to the theory that opens up the binary that, that actually gave us that that blob wasn't just a blob, was two particles interacting through potential field, uh, gravitational fields that also solve Einstein's equation. So that's what we need to do now. We need to match into the theory of, uh, of, of a binary by opening up the binary. Um, but before we do that, uh, let me show you how compute the flux because this is a neat calculation and, and then we can do it once for all and then we don't have to go back to it. Before we do the matching, let me show you how we go into this theory of a binary coupled to long distance modes and a bunch of cues, as I described here at the beginning, this theory here of a bunch of cues of the long distance theory, how this theory here of the binary reproduces the flux that you all know uh, uh, and love. So here, I, the M that I told you before, it couples to the metric, right? Because there is an MD tau there and the D tau knows about the H0, but the reason that you often hear that uh, the M and the P, the momentum, the dipole term that you should have uh, looked at when I asked you where is the dipole or the dipole is the momentum, but it's the total momentum, like the derivative of the center of mass and that you can always gauge away because the center of mass is not moving. So the P dot will be zero in isolation. And in GR or in gravity, you have to take everything. Um, so you, often you hear that those guys don't radiate because they're conserved quantities, right? But you have to be careful, right? Because the binding, the mass is obviously radiated. What happens is it doesn't couple to the physical mode. So this couples to the H00. So it sources the, the Schwarzschild metric. This M is Schwarzschild, a time-dependent Schwarzschild metric around the binary. So the important thing is that what kind of field is sourcing. It's not sourcing the physical modes. The physical modes, which are transverse uh, 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 symmetric trace free, the, the TT gates, uh, transverse traceless, are sourced by this guy. So these are the guys that I care about that they come from here. Okay, so that was important that we got rid of the traces in the field theory when we did the analysis through the wall line redefinitions. So the traces do not radiate, okay? Which is also uh, um, where you can analyze it from the on-shell point of view about what are the 
the actual physical degrees of freedom and so on. Okay. But the nice thing now is that we can actually go on and calculate that an amplitude. We can compute the amplitude to actually produce this physical degrees of freedom, which have two possible helicities, as you know, in the in a spin two field as in gravity. So you can have an amplitude for at least the plus two or at least the minus two. And in this effective theory, it's very easy to compute the amplitude. I mean, how would you compute uh, the amplitude will give you a rate because from the amplitude, you can say how many gravitons you're emitting per time, per phase space. So this would be the phase space. This would be per unit of time or long time. And this would be your total radiated amplitude over all time minus infinity to plus infinity. So you can compute a rate, an, an emission rate by computing an amplitude over the phase space of, of how many gravitons you're emitting and average on time. And this rate then allows you to compute a flux because all you need to do is integrate in the energy, right? Those gravitons have energy, they are on shell. So the energy, the K zero of the gravitons, the K zero of the gravitons is equal to K. And you just have to integrate over all possible energies of all possible gravitons. They are basically uh, uh, the amplitude to meet each one of them will be given by, by, the, by this, this, uh, this object here. And you have a, a phase space integral. And this is on shell, so obviously omega is equal to k. And then you just have to go ahead and do this integral after you compute the amplitude in terms of these couplings. And this is, uh, uh, let me, let me uh, for a second ignore that in yellow. This is very easy to see because, to calculate, because this is just quadrupole emission, current emission. And we did all, all the separation already. These two things don't mix, the Q and the J's don't mix. Can you wait 10 minutes, Sasha, or 15 minutes? Or you have to ask now. Yes, yes, I can wait. I'm trying to unraise my hand. <laughs> okay, I saw no, like no, I cannot wait. <laughs> okay, just I get back to it. Let me just finish this this very quickly. So there is the emission of Q, the emission from J, and so on, and they don't mix. That's the cool thing about doing this separation. Um, so when we compute the onshell amplitude, so we're going to have to contract the amplitude with some epsilon with some uh, polarization tensor that will carry the, the two helicity states, but it's very easy to compute the amplitude from here and from here, right? So this, you have a QIJ times two derivatives, this is just omega square. This one has an epsilon, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's uh, um, the epsilon from the B, from the BIJ, but this also gives you something like this, and then dot, 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 you keep all the multiples. And then when you square it, you have to use the polarization sum, and this polarization sum is just a bunch of deltas. You put it all together, and then you end up with an integral in K, which you can just move into an integral on omega when you, you can think about it as a Fourier transform. And then you get this integral here, which is an integral of all possible omegas of all possible frequencies between zero and infinity. And this guy here, you can think about as the average as the integral in time if you Fourier transform. And this is uh, uh, three derivatives and three derivatives is a QQ star in Fourier. So they're real in time, but they're complex in Fourier space. So this matches into Q triple dot squared. And this is the celebrated, um, uh, this would be like the average, that's what this time is doing here because you get an integral in time over all minus infinity to plus infinity, but then you divide by time. So this pi goes into the d omega to go into the dt integral and then you get the average over, because we're also doing an adiabatic expansion, remember? So it's actually the integral over all time, average over all the time, you get an average flux. So this average flux is computed in terms of derivatives of the multiple. And then dot, 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 um, we get all the, all the stuff that we want. And before I answer Sasha's question, let me tell you one thing, which has to do with the boundary condition, because now I'm going into the radiation theory. So I'm, I'm touching the H bar modes, the radiation modes. And I was telling you about the I epsilons before, that the propagators of that guy are relevant. Well, it so happens that you can do a trick. It's like you can use the optical theorem. You can do, take the, your QE theory, you can then integrate out your long distance radiation modes using the in-out boundary condition, the Feynman I epsilon. You do the cat, you do the imaginary part that puts those, for those, for those gravitons on shell, and then the imaginary part is exactly the flux. All you need to match then is that well, there will be a QQ correlator here, obviously, but at different times. But then when you do the Fourier transform, you're gonna get the same integral that I showed you before. So you're gonna get the QW, the Q in, in omega, that given frequency is square. And then the many derivatives will come because each one of these guys has many couplings. 
And then you just need the imaginary part of the correlator that pick up, as I just told you, the, the on-shellness condition. And then, uh, well, it's the, it's the uh, Feynman boundary condition. This precisely reproduces this calculation. So this was the way it was done originally. Or how can it be done also if you know the full answer? If you know the full answer, when you integrate out the entire gravitational field, not just potentials and radiation, you go to the off-shell modes, the potential modes, which don't care about the epsilon, which are off-shell, and you get all the part that has to do with the binding that we will do in a second. And then you can also integrate out the radiation modes, and you're gonna get imaginary parts if you use in our boundary conditions, because you don't allow any radiation to go out. So that's the trick of the optical theorem. You send it all back in. So you basically, you get twice the, fla the flags back. And this is also a trick that you can use if you know the full answer, is by looking at cuts, and then you can also get the flaxes that way. But for us, it was more efficient, at least in post-Newtonian. When we do post-Minkowski, and if I have time to tell a little bit about that, this might be also something that you could do. Uh, but from the post-Newtonian point of view, it's much easier to match the cues and then just use the general formula that we just computed here, and then just plug it in here instead of computing imaginary parts of something that would just reproduce this. So if I tell you who the Qs are, who is this Q? And now I have to actually do the matching that I told you before in the T-minus. And how do they evolve? Because I need to take dots, and that's how I need to do the binding energy part to actually be able to compute the dots. Then I'm done, because then I know how to compute the E dot part. I'm gonna be able to have to compute the E, the binding energy that at the first lecture I told you is the two ingredients that I need to compute the phase, okay? So what I'm gonna do from now on is tell you who the Qs are and how to take derivatives. And the first part will be to match the T minu because remember the Qij, a leading order in derivatives is just the integral of T C O C O X I X J, and there will be higher order corrections that we need to do. So now comes the actual matching part after we did all the generic thing, in which is get rid of the potentials. Obviously in a classical theory, but this is uh, what we will do uh, in, in the uh, QFT language because it will land into the Feynman approach, Feynman diagrams and so on, that will be very useful for us to parameterize uh, the answer. And I should probably answer uh, now uh, uh, Sasha's question before I start this, so shoot. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, what is the relation of this equation for the energy loss and the, uh, so in the full nonlinear theory we have Bondi mass loss equation, right? Which, Very good. So I have it okay. here as a footnote somewhere. Let me see if I if I can find it here. This. So this will come from the full T minu. So if you compute now the T minu of the including the H bar, remember when I computed here, that's what I was trying to tell you about the the uh, the support of this field of this T minu. So when I'm doing this, I'm actually I'm actually here only including the big H, only the potential H. Okay, only the potentials that live in here. That's what goes into, this is whoop, this is what it goes into here. It's not the full T minu of the full theory of the nonlinear theory that includes these guys as well in the mm -hmm. nonlinear theory. If I compute the full guy in the full nonlinear theory of the H bars as well, then you're completely right. If I compute that guy and impose the, conserve, uh, the conservation of that guy, the full, full T minu, then the equation that will come out will be precisely m dot equals lambda. Okay, it will just come out of the equation when you compute the t minu as a one point function because you're going to have diagrams in which you have the mass, but also you're going to have diagrams. Let me do it properly. You're also going to have diagrams like this when this is qq. And those two are going to contribute to the one point function that will give me the matching for the t minu. And this one will be the flux, and this one will have the m dot. So you can exactly recover okay, okay, what you okay. expect. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I knew that uh, uh, maybe this would come up. Okay, excellent, let me just delete this. Uh, I don't know, maybe I erased something that I shouldn't have. Anyway, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. task, good. We don't have much time. So hopefully between uh, uh, the end of today and tomorrow, we will do this matching both for the binding energy and for the cues, so we can actually do a computation beyond the in order, which will be useful to understand how this carries over, okay? So we need to know who this guy is to compute the flux, to the cues and um, octopus and so on. How do they evolve? And as I told you at the very beginning, we're gonna use the conservative equations of motion to evolve these guys in this adiabatic approximation, 
okay? So we need to get the binding energy from which we can get the equations of motion because if we know the binding potential, we know the equations of motion. And those is how we're gonna take these dots. And we're gonna match in, into the full, the full local theory with potentials to know who this Q is, which means I need to input the T00 in that integral to know what I need to take derivatives of, okay? So very good. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we need the two parts of, of the T mu. We need the T00 part that will also give us the binding, which I think, I don't know if I put it here, uh, here. So the mass is obviously, when you do the matching of the first term of shell, this is what I was telling you at the beginning, the mass is just the moment of T00. So that, if you look at the T00, that's the binding. And um, the Tij, which is the one that we actually decompose and so on, will give us the, um, the radiation. Now, a hydrogen in multiples, in fact, the Qij will also have derivatives of the T00 that are going to contribute. So in the derivative expansion, you will see, because of the moment relations are mixing, actually, they want to be Ij, but the Tij through the moment relations, you saw be translated into the T00, which addresses the mass, and you think, oh, but this is unphysical. Well, it's just one way to do the gauge invariant calculation of the flats, right? Mixing the IJs and the zero zeros and so on, because the gauge invariance tells you that the calculation is the same. Okay. So very good. What are we going to do? We're going to do the often uh, taught uh, QFT path integral, in which we have a theory that has two fields. We have the radiation, which is our IR. We have our potentials, which are our UV. Are we going to remove the potentials by doing this integral? Now, obviously, we're going to do the classical saddle point approximation, which means we're not going to have any loops of these fields. We're not going to loop the H menu. The H menu will be always, always three level. The wall line, the particles are described by this wall line theory that includes the love number and the R scale and so on. But it's a source. This will become, this guy becomes the same as a J, a source like you do often in field theory when you comp compute the partition function. So this is what we're doing, okay? We're doing a partition function, treating these guys as sources, okay? And we're integrating, we're integrating only the potentials because we want to match into an effective theory that has only the radiation field. Now, you have to be careful to do this because we're gonna respect the gauge invariance, right, of the long distance theory. So you do the background field gauge. So this guy becomes a background field gauge fixing, which includes the covariant derivatives of the radiation field. So there's a, a few subtleties in how to do this matching, how to do this integral, such that we can actually write what I told you at the beginning, a T mu nu H mu nu coupling that is conserved. This T mu nu is conserved. So what we get out of this matching will respect these manipulations that I did earlier. And that's the trick of using the background field, okay? But once we do this matching, we're gonna get precisely what the T minu is and what precisely all these moments are and so on, which are functions of the positions, but also include the binding, which is uh, the important part um, in this calculation. And again, I mean, we're doing in out. If I was doing imaginary parts, when I integrate the, the DH bar, I would get the flux to the imaginary part. But here, I just put this coming here in terms of J, this is the J, but just because, um, uh, you have to choose some boundary conditions, but potentials are not off shell. Uh, sorry, are not on shell, they're off shell. So when we just do this integral, this is not relevant. The I epsilon will not be relevant. You never have imaginary parts here. You never radiate the potentials. And therefore, this is not important. It will be important when we deal with this guy, okay? But let me first tell you how do we do the binding? How do we do the binding energy? Well, the binding energy was, as I said, the T00. And you see here that it couples precisely to the H00, right? So it's very clear that the effective theory is this. This is the same manipulation we did before, but now for the 00, zero component, so clearly this integral matches into M, so M has to be this. So I can do the matching of the one-point function and read off the H00, zero zero, the H00 zero zero component of the, uh, the coupling to the stress, stress tensor, and that should give me the binding mass, the bonding mass, the M dot, the one that radiates, okay? The one that doesn't include the full, full space time. Uh, but, but you can be smarter and match the one instead. We're gonna match the one instead of matching the H00, uh, because the one is the same as the H00. They come together through the detail. 
What do I mean? Is that in vacuum, you also get a binding energy. In the isolated guy has a binding energy. And this binding energy in vacuum will give us the potential. This binding energy will be, um, did I write it here? No, I did not. This binding energy will be here, is we have K plus V. And this V is what's gonna give us the equation of motion that we need for um, putting the dots on the Qs, okay? So we can just go ahead and match for B directly in vacuum. And then that saves us a little bit of, of work because we don't have to put A0 zeros zero in the standard state. What it means here is that we just don't match for A0 zero zero, which match in vacuum without any radiation outside. So that means, uh, again, no closed loops. And it has to be connected in the sense that we are exponentiating. So the full partition function will be the sum of all these guys. But obviously, we, we can exponentiate into the uh, 1PI diagrams, right, into the connected guys. And then I, I wrote this in here. So the full partition function that we're doing actually includes all these diagrams. For example, if I'm doing just the three level, the, the linear theory will be all these diagrams. But you can easily show that the exponentiates to the one point function, right? So in principle, I had to include all these guys. But if I'm doing just the, the one graviton exchange, and I want to compute the order G correction to the effective action setting this to zero. So I'm doing the matching now with this set to zero because it's going to match into M1 and I'm going to get that one, the potential. It's going to make my life way easier than the match with this guy, not zero. And at the same time, I can get my, my equations of motion from the potential, which is very useful because we want the equations of motion for the dots. So very good. So now I'm matching or doing the internal potential without any external field. So it's gonna, it's gonna be just, just a function of the sources, no radiation outside. And it's gonna exponentiate, and we're gonna just look at the connective diagrams that are gonna exponentiate into the effective action. And by the way, this is, this is naturally what happens also in the iconal approximation, right? We're building up the full kick, which the kick builds up out of H bar over R, quantum, quant so-called quantum kicks, right? One of our wavelength kicks, we actually get an order S over H bar number of kicks that contributes to the building up of the effective action. Even though we're computing the three level, you're thinking, well, but why am I using three level? It's classical. Now we're actually summing a large number of kicks to build up the classical um, effective action, okay? And this, this is important to keep in mind because in the icona, for example, we're doing the same. Um, to build up the field. So we're now doing the one point function, uh, sorry, the zero point function, we're matching in vacuum to just read off the M and read off the potential. So what we do here, I just, this is the, the, the three level matching. Um, in any, any, at any order in G Newton, you're gonna have complicated diagrams. We integrate out the potential mode. So this will be just potentials. These are my sources. These guys are the sources. And then you have all the propagators and so on that you need to do an integral. We do that integral and we didn't put any radiation outside. So what is it gonna match into? It's gonna match into the M. If we factor out the kinetic term, the kinetic term is gonna be here in the MD tau. You just take it out because it goes for the right. The leftover is your potential. So this matches into the potential. And these are just the Wilson lines, okay? This is very easy. You've done it in QCD. It's the lattice people, okay? So you integrate out this with the source. If you're doing a heavy quartz source, for example, you do the stacking quartz potential. It's exactly the same. This is doing it perturbatively. This is doing it in gravity. And this is doing it with the potential mode. But it's the same idea. And, and, and let me show you, uh, do, how much time do I have? Let me show you just quickly the one, the one uh, uh, PM case, the order G case, just briefly to see where these this potentials came from. So I have three minutes, right? So let me, let me just do this in three minutes. And then we will do a little bit more uh, later. So imagine we're doing the, the one graviton exchange which will be this guy, right? So the source here has some coupling. If you expand a linear order in H mu nu, in H potential mu nu, the M d tau, the B mu B mu, then you get a B mu H mu nu, B mu B nu H mu nu coupling, right? So you get a coupling like this here for particle two, you get a coupling like this, like particle one. And we are solving, we are solving for that and plugging it back, which means we are solving the Green's function and putting it back into the action. So we can think of that as computing the one point function as a propagator. And this is the full propagator of this field. I haven't done any approximation here 
whatsoever. This is the full order G. The only thing that I've done is chosen the, my RPI invariance such that the, the, the uh, affine parameter is the coordinate time. So this is the DT. So the V0 components of these guys will be one. And this is gonna be useful because we're gonna get a potential as a VDT, not as a VD tau, okay? So that's why RPI will be useful for us in this context, okay? So how are we gonna do this integral? In, in principle, it's a complicated integral because this, these guys depend on time, they're moving, okay? So we're gonna post Newtonian expand the solution. We're gonna say that those guys move non-relativistically. This is where the potential modes enter, which means we're gonna expand that full propagator into the one over P square vector that I told you before. The first correction will be at P zero over P square, which we can trade by derivatives. When we do here e to the i P zero x zero, x zero will be time. And P zero upstairs, I can trade by derivatives that I can then integrate by parts. So all this will cost me velocities. I'm almost done, Kriakos. I'm gonna choose the redonder gauge and I'm gonna sum all these corrections to get all the velocity corrections. But I'm gonna motivate to you where this came from. This came out of my ass, right? Because how do you know that this is correct? That this is really doing the correct post Newtonian expansion? You should be computing this, the full integral, then expanding velocity and show that expanding inside the integral is the same. And this is the method of regions, but let me motivate it to you. Let's do the static case. Let's, let's do the case in which this, these guys do not depend on time. So the dots are zero. So what happens here is that you're gonna get the P zero DT, but there is a DT outside, okay? So ah, I separated, here the Schubert mean space. I already had separated, look, it's here. So the P zero T, T1 and T2. But these guys now, if they're static, these guys do not depend on time. So the P zero integral is alone. It becomes a delta function, okay? As it becomes a delta function of P zero, this delta function of P zero kills the time component. And then this is not an approximation. This is the exact result, okay? The static exact result is just the Coulomb potential. But if we move a little bit, if this wants to be zero in the static case, if we move a little bit, it's obviously gonna be corrected in a derivative expansion. So what happens when it's not zero? Well, we have to do the, the same integral and the zero or the here I try to explain. The first correction becomes derivatives of the delta. This derivatives of the delta, because when you integrate this guy now, you're gonna get a P zero, the P zero you can trade by derivatives. You can then integrate by parts and hit this guy. And when you bring down some P's and some V's, you can just do this integral. This integral is very easy. You do the decomposition in trace free and trace part, and it gives you corrections to the potential. So that's, you do it to all orders and you include all the velocity corrections. And you can show, because as I was telling you, the static part is basically motivating us to look at this potential region, that if you do the full integral, I can actually do that, this one is easy, and expand in post-Newtonian that you get precisely the same as this expansion before doing the integral. And this is the method of regions. And you can show, you screw up the IR on the UV, but you, if you have dimensional regularization, if you understand how to, not to double count, then you're fine. And then we'll see hopefully an example. So to complete the 1 p.m. potential, we also need contributions from the propagators, the zero i coupling to the zero j coupling, the i j coupling to the zero zero coupling. There's also a velocity here inside the square root of the d tau, but the d tau in the Minkowski space, all that contributes at 1 p.m. But we will be missing one term, and this literally takes me 30 seconds, because remember post-Newtonian mixes the velocity expansion at order G1 with the B0 term of the 2 p.m. correction, the second post Minkowskian correction, the G square correction, because GM over R is V square. So we get mixing of nonlinearities in G and post Newtonian expansion. So we need also this nonlinear term. And these are like one loop integrals, very easy one loop integrals that come from the three graviton or from the nonlinearity that will correct my potential. You put all this together and you go on and recover in literally, like, I don't know, few lines of mathematical code, what took Einstein, Infel, and Hoffman, I think 30 pages of surface integrals. So this is extremely simple. And then you can compute the binding energy at 1 p.n. exactly by including all these nonlinearities as well. And next time I'll tell you where we are here and a new development, and then we jump into the radiation to match now the one point function to get the Qs 
From the queue, you're going to take dot and compute the flux to 1 p.m. And then you know now how to go and crank the machinery, hopefully to higher order. And then the subtleties of tails and memories, maybe we do it next time. Because that's, that's pretty, very pretty, gives RG flows and so on. But I'm not going to have time in four one hour lectures to cover it, unfortunately. So we'll have a second round. So I'll stop here and please uh, ask questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael.